it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ranitza Degoba. I'm a professor of economics in GBI in the school. Uh, I've known Ranitza for a very long time, actually, that before even Ranitza joined us in 2010, uh, in, in, the, in what is known as IGPM. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about Ranitza's work a little bit later, so that I'll keep towards the after Ranitza's lecture, just a little bit. Ranitza wants to introduce the work. But it's, uh, it's fantastic for us to have Ranitza uh, um, as a professor because her work is so unusual, so original, so different from the work that used to happen in GDI, in, in previously. And I think uh, we're going to hear a lot about that, but it's just been amazing to follow the career that Alice has had here in, uh, in Lewis Manchester. And it's also been amazing how she has taken us to very different areas of work that we never did before. And, uh, and that's why it's so exciting to, uh, to, to have you let tell us about the work Forward. I also want to say that you know the many colleagues that we've had interacted with in, in GDI and SEED, um, often we often think that how can they do so much? I mean, really, so you feel like how can they should do so much and still so much more? Um, she's been amazing the way she's contributed to not only the research you hear about, but also about teaching and administration, in supervision, and many other in many other areas. It's really amazing to think of one person doing so much. And, and in each of these areas, she has done far more than what they in the natural. So, so I also mentioned that it's not also a great research she's done, it's also an amazing belief in most part of the lots of the and administration in Jinnia and also in CT. So I'm going to now ask Alisa to provide the person lecture, which I'll come over later to say a little bit more about your work. And at that point, I will also say a few things. Good afternoon, and uh, many thanks for being here. Many thanks, Kunal, for the introduction. Uh, over the past several weeks, colleagues have been asking me what I'm going to talk about uh, and whether I'm nervous. In fact, I was not nervous before they started asking me. Now I'm pretty much <laughs> trembling. Uh, moreover, that uh, I recently got engaged in one philosophical debate uh, with somebody about uh, the value of the things that we are doing and about the people who do uh, things with their hands and produce things that we can touch with our hands uh, versus uh, academics like us, especially in social sciences, that just speak and write things. So I started having serious existential problems and started uh, questioning what I'm uh, doing professionally. Uh, but then I remembered that uh, it was intellectuals like us who were behind the big ideologies, behind uh, all the great revolutions, and decided that probably uh, there is value of continuing to be uh, curious, just trying to understand the world, uh, and hopefully, if not individually, at least collectively, uh, believe that the world will change for the better. Uh, in this sense, I was uh, really uh, lucky uh, because uh, I grew up in Eastern Europe uh, when the Berlin Wall fell uh, and everything uh, Ex uh, changed uh, upside down, uh, we experienced a major socioeconomic uh, upheaval. Uh, and uh, overnight, uh, I, got, uh, I received a sea of uh, opportunities uh, and was really privileged to have them uh, just because of the place and time I was uh, born in. Uh, I started to begin with uh, researching the adjustment of uh, individuals and uh, people to this very uh, strange uh, environment. And in, uh, in development economics, one big uh, area of research and policy debate uh, is that of uh, institutions. The narrative being that uh, the countries that are uh, currently rich and uh, so advanced also socially uh, have some uh, simply developed the right type of uh, institutions, while uh, those that are poor are poor because they didn't manage to develop uh, this type of uh, good institutions. Now what happened in uh, East Europe overnight was that we imported uh, the right type of institutions uh, and at least on paper they were uh, adjusted, they were um, um, incorporated in the changing environment, uh, but it is decades since then uh, that uh, many of these countries are finding it extremely difficult to uh, catch up economically with the rich countries, uh, and even socially with the liberal democracies of the West. 
So one reason for that uh, is that informal institutions or social norm are finding it difficult to catch up with the formal institutions, and that's why these countries are lagging behind. So when uh, researching the adjustment of individuals to the new environment, I was very interested uh, in this tension between formal and informal institutions. Uh, later on, uh, I had uh, the privilege to work with uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams, uh, first in the Max Planck Institute uh, for Demographic Research, then with sociologists in France, uh, later on uh, with nutritional specialists uh, specializing in biology. Uh, in France, uh, I created uh, some uh, network uh, and was able to uh, develop a lot of contacts in West Africa, which uh, uh, became one of the core focuses of my research geographically. Uh, and I, then I put together uh, these interdisciplinary experiences uh, as well as the uh, geographic experience uh, in developing my uh, more mature career. At the beginning, I was using large data in trying to analyze uh, the issues that uh, I was uh, interested in, mainly uh, with, in the context of uh, uh, intra-household allocation of resources, uh, with focus mainly on social norms and the tension between social uh, norms and formal institutions. Uh, but more recently, uh, I became really uh, interested uh, in behavioral economics and uh, started uh, analyzing uh, intra-household allocation of resources using uh, lab in the field uh, experience uh, experiments, uh, again, in my favorite context of uh, West uh, Africa. Uh, we have had some interesting <coughs> findings in this context, uh, in some sense uh, counterintuitive, uh, compared to the findings that uh, we were getting when working with uh, uh, large data sets. Uh, and much of the explanation uh, came from the social norms existing in this environment. We only tentatively uh, uh, interpreted our findings using social norms uh, based on conversations that we were having with local people. Uh, but uh, these discussions were so interesting that uh, in the current project that I am doing, uh, I am explicitly uh, focused on eliciting social norms uh, using lab in the field experiment. Uh, what does this boil down to uh, conceptually? Uh, my main interest is in the household uh, as a core decision maker uh, and in the decision making that is happening within the household. Uh, and there are, of course, many different decisions that households have to take, uh, especially in the poor environments that uh, I'm interested in. They have to think, obviously, about their survival and basic nutrition. They have to take related decisions uh, in the job market. And if they are farmers, what kind of crops to produce? They have to think about the future and the investment in their children. And within economics policy making, uh, the focus is on providing the right type of opportunities and uh, incentives for these people to take the right decisions in all these uh, areas. But these decisions don't happen in a vacuum, uh, and to a large extent they are driven by uh, social norms and the cultural environment, and that's why the outcomes of policies are um, sometimes very surprising and not as expected by the policy makers. Now, uh, social norms are net not set on stone, uh, and they change over time, but they tend to be very sticky, and they change only very slowly over time. And I have worked a lot on migration, uh, and the observation, obviously, is that uh, people uh, do change when they cross borders, but they carry much of this cultural uh, luggage uh, with themselves, even when crossing borders. I have applied this conceptual framework in several different uh, contexts. When I first started working on uh, West Africa, the key word that I kept hearing was food crisis. Uh, in that case, more, uh, mostly because of uh, climate change and the increasing uh, incidence of droughts and uh, floods and the related increase in food prices. Uh, governments have been trying to address this problem by uh, designing uh, various uh, food self-sufficiency programs. Uh, many of them uh, failed because, more, mainly because of governance uh, issues. But my main interest is not in these programs, but more uh, on uh, the social norms 
uh, that are related to uh, production of uh, food as well as consumption of food. And one interesting social norm in this respect is uh, property rights and the allocation of property rights across uh, men and women. In this specific context in which I worked, women generally don't have control over land and direct uh, access uh, to resources. Uh, and that's why uh, males are, uh, male producers are typically the ones that engage in uh, commercial agriculture and benefit from the revenues from that, while women mostly engage in uh, food production on the land that is allocated to them by the husband. Uh, curiously, uh, in the context of the so-called food crisis, many women and households as a whole uh, benefited uh, because of the uh, informal arrangements. Uh, for example, because uh, women were the main producers of food, uh, the food crisis resulted in a positive reallocation of resources and reduced some of the intra-household and inter-household uh, inequalities. On other occasions, uh, due to uh, negative production uh, shocks, male uh, producers were uh, pushed into the off-farm uh, market and women took their position on the farm and got engaged in commercial agriculture. We, one big uh, policy agenda in this respect is to set the property rights uh, right and give equal access to women to uh, resources, mainly land resources. But a lot of uh, formalization of uh, property rights for women uh, was not effective because, again, the social norms didn't necessarily catch up uh, with that. Sometimes uh, even uh, informal um, norms related to uh, female land ownership don't help uh, either. So I have uh, researched uh, matrilinear and patrilinear um, uh, norms, including with uh, some colleagues uh, here. Uh, and we see that uh, even that doesn't help when women don't have access to additional resources and markets. Another big uh, area of interest to me uh, has been the broader area of investment in children and inter-household uh, relations, both in the upward and the downward sense, both relations towards parents and relations towards uh, children. And my first project was uh, dealing with uh, three generation uh, households uh, of migrants. Um, it was done for the social security office in France and the belief was that uh, migrants are hanging on the social security uh, system in France. But because of these uh, intergenerational solidarities and the need to help the parents abroad, we found that uh, migrants uh, tend to be very productive, something much more uh, product sometimes much more productive than locals that do the same type of uh, jobs. Uh, in a different project, uh, I found that uh, very interesting things also with respect to downward transfers towards uh, children and investing uh, both money and time uh, in children. We discovered a special mother-daughter relationship whereby uh, better endowed mothers were helping monetarily uh, their daughters, while mothers with uh, lower um, human capital endowments uh, tended to help their daughters more uh, with time provision, uh, and this was really helping uh, with the establishment of the daughters in the labor market. Uh, but the so-called concept of mother caring more, which is something uh, that uh, um, economist Blundell uh, came up with, doesn't necessarily always um, hold uh, universally. Uh, not because mo the mother doesn't care more, uh, the mother cares the most, uh, but because uh, of social norms that often make uh, allocation of resources across children unequal, uh, and uh, also because uh, men and women tend to have different priorities with respect to the type of resources that are being allocated to children. Some of our research found that mother are more, mothers are more concerned with basic survival and nutrition, while uh, fathers uh, are more interested in uh, allocating resources towards uh, education. And if this is the case in a specific context, then uh, the opinion of the father may have to be taken seriously into account. Uh, either way, uh, the collaboration of uh, men and women within the household is crucially important. And some of uh, uh, our uh, experimental research involved uh, trust 
within the family, and we saw that trust and collaboration with the uh, family is crucial uh, for uh, efficient investment in children. Of course, this is also uh, influenced a lot by uh, formal and informal institutions. Uh, now, uh, saying a few words about um, uh, the behavioral experiments, which uh, in uh, an area in which uh, uh, I am new, uh, I found them uh, really exciting and a great way of uh, um, finding answers to uh, questions, uh, especially in uh, the area, for example, of uh, female uh, empowerment. Uh, when uh, using um, ready data collection on households and individuals, we often proxy uh, female empowerment with certain existing variables, for example, whether the woman works or not. The assumption being that if a woman moves from being a housewife uh, to uh, becoming employed, this increases her empowerment. But there is a lot of evidence that uh, very often uh, when women work, they experience even more violence at home. Uh, another uh, set of uh, common measures of em female empowerment have to do with how much resources the woman has brought to the household uh, by marriage, but a uh, very often this traps women in abusive households because they find it much more difficult to go back to their uh, house, uh, household of uh, origin. So uh, we benefited from uh, lab in the field experiments to actually observe behavior rather than relying on proxy variables and imply uh, female empowerment based on these uh, variables. Another uh, very useful uh, way of using lab with the field experiments is in eliciting social norms. There are uh, methodologies that allow us to uh, elicit the social norms that uh, exist in the community. Now we can do that using qualitative data and in our current project we are uh, working with sociologists that uh, use qualitative data to understand uh, the, what the social norms in the community are, but using lab in the field experiments, we can do that across a much larger number of people, give, give them a, qu a quantitative uh, measure, and talk to some extent about some causal relationships. Now, like uh, any methodology, uh, lab in the field experiments are no, not flawless. Uh, of course, we have to rely on uh, certain assumptions when we are designing these experiments. Uh, and we are doing them in a very controlled settings, which sometimes can be very controlled. Uh, for example, I was trying to understand uh, conflict in West Africa, and uh, we did a pilot on students in the UK uh, because uh, this was the cheapest option. Of course, when we simulate it within the UK, it's very difficult to get any uh, a meaningful results because this is a very selected sample of uh, students, so it was completely useless uh, exercise. But of course, it's also very challenging uh, to go in an environment in which there is already an ethnic conflict. We put people from different fighting ethnicities together, uh, and we uh, ask them to play games that are measuring conflict. Uh, and another uh, problem that uh, I'm personally currently um, facing is to not only uh, induce uh, or um, create measures of uh, social norms using these methods, but also uh, make a policy simulation uh, which could help us see whether social norms uh, change. And we, uh, we are currently working on this methodology, and it turns out to be very tricky because with whatever we have done so far, uh, it's very difficult when we see both a change in the norm and a change in an outcome of interest to understand uh, where the relationship comes from. So is it the outcome that changed first, and gradually the outcome leads to change in the social norm, or is it the social norm that changes and this changes the outcomes? Uh, there is very little research in this area. Uh, we have come, for example, uh, across some research, again, on West Africa, uh, where women tend to be the producers of food, like uh, rice. So when uh, uh, there was a technological innovation which made rice more productive, uh, men started moving to that domain. And the result of research was that, oh, previously rice was a female crop. Now suddenly it became a male crop because of this technological innovation. But then we don't know what the uh, answer is, whether the social norm was really that the crops were male and female, or whether the norm was that males, male, men will always go into the most productive 
uh, technology and production, and this is what actually happened. So the norm uh, remained the same, and it is just the outcome that uh, changed. Uh, so, uh, going back to the uh, issue of uh, uh, impact, um, I find the way impact is measured in our uh, circles very stressful because we have to put it in every grant and expect impact yesterday, not uh, tomorrow. Um, and even in uh, the type of disciplines, as I said, that people produce something that we can touch with our hands, this happens only gradually uh, over time. Uh, so some years ago, I watched a documentary about graphene. Uh, the documentary was called uh, The Innovations That Changed uh, the World. And graphene was mentioned as one of the life-changing uh, innovations uh, which would uh, revolutionize uh, transport, among other things. Uh, but still many years uh, after that, uh, this hasn't happened. And for the time being, we are just hoping that uh, we'll move towards electric cars, uh, which are also not entirely non-polluting. Uh, so any research uh, produces impact only gradually over time. But one area in which we do produce impact is uh, teaching. And I tried on this map to um, create links with uh, contacts that uh, I have with former PhD students. I didn't include um, I didn't include uh, the master's students because if I do that, then everything, the whole graph will be red and it will be very difficult to make the point. But uh, one of the last projects, uh, consultancy projects that I received, I received it via a student in the World Bank. And when I started uh, talking with the people that were leading the project, uh, project in the World Bank, I saw that the lead of the project was a former student of mine uh, who has done her, PhD, uh, her master's degree here. So our students are all over the place and do real change in the real world. Uh, and thinking about that and uh, keeping in touch with them makes me very optimistic about the future. This is one major impact that we can make with our research and our teaching. Thank you. Valisa, uh, we're going to have a 10 minutes q and I just want to say a few more words about you, because I want to say that at the end. That, uh, as a first couple of pers about personal uh, uh, observation. So Valisa joined the drawing 10, as I mentioned earlier. I remember at that time, I was, I was in this discussion with Valisa, that why do you an economics department? She was in Brunel, coming to the Studies Department, as a strategist economist. And I remember at that time, there was quite a bit of concern that, is this a good move for me? And not only did she take a lunch and joining us in IDPA in 2010, she actually embraced the multidisciplinary nature of the department because you could, you saw reflected today, it was also based on technology, economics, sociology, and of course economics together in one place. And that's quite remarkable for someone who comes from a fairly stateless economics background to bring together to see different disciplines into this world that she's doing. The second thing I feel that I've been amazed about is that when she started working on behavioral economics in the field, there's no one working on it in this university. In fact, it's a very new field. And it's a big risk for her because that work is not yet very popular in economics, in debt economics. Then she went, went for it. She took the big, big plunge, took the risk, and now we have this fantastic work that we hear we heard today that's bringing together not only the work in Africa, in Africa elsewhere, and the network that she's created, the British academic ground that she's got. So taking that risk, I think it's very important for all of us here. But sometimes you're not sure the returns are. And when you make that take, make that, take that risk, the returns can be quite enormous. And I think the lesson for all of us to think about. Uh, on a personalized name, note also, I would say that Marisa is an accomplished classical guitarist. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got to, she's also there is a royal uh, school of music. And it's amazing that after all of this, she, and also the, the are so proficient in classical guitar, and also proficient in, in formal French language, because she's issues with lots of and things like that. All right, now let's get the Q&A, and uh, we're going to have 10 minutes or so on Q&A, and then maybe, and then we're going to have a vote of thanks for Professor Alma Basu, who's joining us virtually from the U.S. He's Professor of University. I think I saw him earlier on the virtual, he's actually around the call, but I'm always going to join us shortly by Zoom. So perhaps we can have a couple of questions for Alexa, and Alexa, uh, maybe then we can answer these questions. So people can raise their hands because we don't have much time. So it's good to get a couple of questions in. Um, and yeah, sorry, I don't know if you can go ahead.
So thank you, it's a great presentation. So you mentioned uh, uh, policy-driven uh, social norm changes versus outcome-driven uh, norm changes. So in your project, how did you define as a social norms and uh, so what was your conclusion so on that hypothesis? Can you explore that a little bit, please? Thank you. Okay, it's a very technical question. Uh, <laughs> okay, shall we get several questions yeah, or yeah, respond? Uh, yeah. so, uh, David, answer. Okay, David, please. No, 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 I was pointing to you. <laughs> Definitely a non technical question, not being an economist. I just like the picture of you did a lab in the field experiment, and I just wondered what was the most surprising thing you found uh, uh, that you really weren't expecting? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> okay. uh, more questions? Yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Thanks very much. That was really that was really interesting. I, I thought particularly it was great that you admitted failure <laughs> in terms of the, the methods and how difficult that is. And actually, it's people don't do that very enough, very often. And and it's my view that you learn an awful lot from that. But I just wondered, um, you described getting this group of people together to talk about very difficult subjects. Mm -hmm. And ethically and morally, that's quite difficult. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about how that went, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, should we, should we yeah, yeah, because I'll forget at some point. Uh, OK. So uh, it's all very difficult questions. Uh, so the. I don't yet have answer to the first question, what, what kind of uh, norms we are inducing, because we haven't quite decided. So it's a project uh, on migration, and we want to see what kind of norms are guiding uh, migration. So uh, we would rely to a large extent first on the qualitative survey that are done in this uh, area, and first decide uh, what kind of uh, norms are relevant for migration, uh, mostly uh, related to women. So for the, for the time being, we want to do uh, research in Ethiopia and uh, Nigeria. And we know that the patterns of migration across men and women differ a lot. Uh, m uh, women tend to uh, go more to the Middle East, while men to, uh, to Europe. And we want to understand what drives uh, these patterns. Uh, as a next step, we'll uh, find out uh, what the relevant policy would be, both uh, internal and external, uh, and see we, what effect they have on the outcomes. But this is a very new project, and we need, uh, still need to uh, figure it out. Now, in terms of uh, surprises, it's a very difficult question, because everything was interesting and surprising. Um, we did many different experiments, mostly on relationship within the household. Uh, and we, uh, one of them was on trust and uh, allocation of resources to a common uh, pot. So uh, we both asked uh, uh, members of the couple to individually allocate resources. And we asked them how much they thought the other partner has allocated. And it was very interesting that the women predicted 100% how much the husband would allocate, while men were really bad about that. Uh, and I'm not sure whether it is because many women uh, there mostly work on their farm and in the household, and they know how much money the husband is bringing and how much he is allocating. But these were very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, findings aside from the bigger ones. So there were others about differences in allocation of resources across girls and boys. But this came, comes from the social norm, and probably as such was not that surprising. Uh, but these tiny details were very interesting to observe. Now, in terms of the methodology, as I said, uh, no method is uh, perfect. Now, the good thing about um, this method, uh, as opposed to, let's say, focus groups and talking about difficult questions, is that we uh, actually make people play games. And they are not even aware uh, that uh, uh, what the actual question uh, is. So it's, in this sense, it's not uh, that sensitive, because uh, in this context, we ask them about allocation of resources to a common pot or keeping uh, by themselves. So it, is, it was not really 
uh, as sensitive as, uh, for example, child labor. Uh, for that, we uh, got observations from ready available surveys. We were not asking them these type of questions. But of course, if we work on conflict, which is one interesting area of research, we have to think it uh, carefully through. Once again, people will be playing games rather than actually fighting physically, but uh, it would be a sensitive environment that we have to consider. And thanks, Actually, we still have five more minutes uh, before we go to vote of times. So if there are further questions, we can still take one, two more. Perhaps. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Do I need the mic? I'll carry it. Okay. You can hear me? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, apologies for that voice. So, brother, so you have a lot of experience and expertise in experimental economics, and you also have experience of, and expertise in econometrics and large data. Mm -hmm. And in development economics now, there are people who are really pushing um, experiments as the way forward, and other people who are pushing big data as the way forward. I wonder if you, you, you'd like to comment mm. on, on that debate and develop economics, given you've got expertise on both sides of the camp. Mm -hmm. um, OK, that's a big question. Let's take another final question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the balance has to be made. So I'm not uh, really um, strongly opposing any methodology. I continue to do uh, both. And uh, these days, you know, uh, many of these, uh, this type of research is done together. So even as part of regular household surveys, people do experiments and incorporate the data within the household surveys. So I think that um, with m m the more disciplines we engage, and in the current project we also do qualitative research, uh, the better we will understand uh, the problems at hand, and uh, hopefully uh, the better contribution this will have for policy making. I mean, just to end, just because I, wonder, I think the, the thing that's I think Alexa's greatness is that she, she brings in second econometry data analysis with experiments, which is that's, that, that's the big mix, right? And I think that's because you really started off as an econometrician with the secondary data sets, and then now more recently started to connect primary data sets to the experimental method. And then to getting those two things is the big, big question that we have in the And I think that's exactly the strength of the as well, because she brings together those two very different approaches that we have seen uh, in the economics. So I just wanted to make that note. I think we can now move to the vote of thanks. That's going to be given Professor Anna Basu. Who's as I said, is going to learn virtually by Zoom. Who's on the bus is Professor of Economics at Cornell University, long time collaborative with Alexa and more recently actually also with me. So I know I think you are there. I think I saw you there. Yeah, go ahead. So can you want to provide a vote of thanks? Absolutely, Kunal. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, okay. I can be heard, or I am being heard. Yes, you can hear. Um, okay, thank you. So uh, let me first uh, start by congratulating both Relitza and Ian on being promoted to full professor. Uh, as we say, it's the final frontier uh, in terms of our academic journey. Uh, and, and you know, finally, uh, one can stop listening carefully to editors, referees, and all kinds of conference <laughs> participants and engaging uh, what you want to do, when you want to do, and how you want to do it. So, so this is. Uh, really a threshold in, in one's academic career and I'm really delighted to see the range of work done by both and I apologize I won't be able to stay for Ian's talk but green architecture and planning is like close to my heart I'm coming from Kolkata, India you know, where everything is unplanned or planned by the British and then uh, destroyed uh, eventually by, by uh, the, the recent generations. So let me come back to, uh, you know, I, I'm going to touch upon quite a few things that Berlin's already spoke about and now highlighted. Uh, so it may not be completely new to, uh, you know, if you're listening in to what I have to say. Uh, but as, as Brunel mentioned, I've known Berlin's for a long time, since the time at Brunel University. Um, and I really marvel at her rich experience working across countries, continents, and research topics. Um, so I'm not really that surprised that migration uh, is a core research agenda for her. 
Um, the only regret I have is that I worked with Rollins a long time after I actually got to know her and, uh, and, and uh, look at her work. Uh, I, I wish I started maybe a few years earlier than I did. Um, touching upon uh, some other non-academic issues, Kunal did mention her classical guitar uh, proficiency and her language proficiencies, but she recently also got a certificate uh, in German, uh, along to, to going with her Bulgarian and French, and I, I'm sure with Russian, and I'm positive that she also knows a fair amount of English, so she is remarkable when it comes to languages. Coming to her work, Raliza uh, mentioned migration, child labor, education, nutrition, social norms as kind of the main uh, aspects of her uh, research agenda. But I do want to point out that Raliza has also worked on uh, entrepreneurship, banking and financial inclusion at the household level. So, uh, so it's a very, very comprehensive uh, research agenda when it comes to the economics of the household. Um, I want to highlight four things. Uh, two are about her research and two that probably are not visible um, quite that uh, obviously. So the first thing is not just the work that is doing when it comes to uh, this um, gender and agriculture, uh, the type of crops men and women are growing, um, and, and the link to social norms. But the enduring part about Rolinza's work is that climate change is really affecting agricultural production, and with that, income from agriculture. With that, the household dynamics uh, within, within uh, agricultural families. So um, one of our very, very interesting papers that came out in World Development uh, looks at uh, droughts and you know, kind of climate shocks that affects the price of staples relative to you know, cash crops and has an effect on female income for primary staple crop producers. And that in turn, which it didn't link in our paper directly, has, has, has implications on empowerment and intra-household bargaining power. So, so this is the line of research that's going to have a really long-term impact as we see this uh, intra-household dynamic shifting because of climate shocks uh, over the long term. Rolinzer uh, pointed out the indigenity between social norms and certain behaviors, and that point is uh, super well taken, uh, because we really don't know uh, how social norms affect certain behaviors. Maybe that's visible. It's, like, it's wrong to say we don't know. We, we do observe some of those. But what we don't know is, is the other way. And to give you a classic example, um, it might be a social norm to migrate. I mean, we have it in southern India where a lot of uh, people in the Middle East fall over. But then they do influence norms back home through communications and remittances. And you see norms evolving, both in, 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 with respect to migration as well as all kinds of other areas, such as child education, uh, female empowerment, so on and so forth. So this, is, this point is really well taken, and, uh, I, and it's an extremely challenging area of research. So I'm sure uh, Relinza is going to do an excellent job. I look forward to reading our papers on this area. I'll touch on two last things. One is, uh, and this is a comment that was made, and Kunali uh, also addressed this, that Relinza's ability to adapt and incorporate new methodologies to tackle our research questions. It's not one size fits all. And of course, we talked about big data and lab in the field experiments, but what is not obvious, unless you read our papers, is that within econometrics itself, Relinza has constantly evolved from working with instrumental variables approach to difference in difference, lasso techniques, and so on and so forth. So there's a constant uh, effort on, on, on Relinza's part to keep up to date and work at the frontier of things. We talked about lab in the experiments, but we probably don't know. Relinza also has a paper on whether or not we use RCTs. 
So she is well conversant with the idea of asking keys, even though she has yet to uh, employ it on the field. The last part, um, we're talking about research mostly, but uh, you know, the Kunal touched upon this a little bit also, that Lulitzer's um, reach when it comes to mentoring uh, is, is really uh, long. And I've seen it firsthand uh, how she has worked with researchers uh, from Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire um, as postdocs, as researchers on the lab and the field experiment, but it's not just working with them. Rolitza fully incorporates them into the project and gives them equal authorship. And, and actually, Rolitza makes sure that they are co authors on all the projects that she has done um, on the field. So, uh, I'm going to stop with that. It's been a pleasure working with uh, Rolitza and getting to know her. And, 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 and extremely pleased to see her, um, you know, uh, going through uh, the academic life at Manchester and then being promoted to full. And she's super young, so I do expect the next 40 years to see <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to Thank you. Thank you, Arnett, for those words, and thank you, Canal, as well. And most of all, um, thank you, uh, Professor, for that really interesting lecture. Let's just give a <laughs>